We are recording. Welcome to the Boulder Junction Access District Joint Commission meeting. It is Wednesday, March 17th, 2023. No, no, no. It's May 17th. Oh my gosh. Wait, what's wrong? Thank you, Chris. It is May 17th, 2023. And I will call roll. Sue Print. Everybody's on here. here. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Shriver. Jennifer is here. I see, I see her, yeah. Her on the list, but I don't see her on camera. Jennifer, are you can you hear us? Are you able to respond? Okay. She, okay. Right. she is here. And Rebecca Dumachel. I'm here. You. Ryan Cook. Hi, present. Hey. Um, Kevin Knapp is not present. And Robin Ronan. Present. Thank you. And I will pass it over to our chair. We do have a quorum for both. Um, DJ parking and TDM today, as long as Ryan sticks around. I do have only like 30, maybe close to an hour minutes um, available today. So hopefully okay, we can we'll try knock to... out anything at the beginning that would require the quorum. Great. Sounds like a plan. Um, who would like to take, since we don't have Kevin here. Sue, would you like to um, chair Wait, the meeting? Sorry, I have a question, Chris. How do we have quorum for for parking? Um, we have three. Uh, Robin, Robin's in person. Okay, sorry. I can, but uh, like Ryan, I'm trying to get out kind of early, but I can share. I have an event that I got scheduled to table at. All right. Well, we will try to move quickly through the uh, agenda. Okay, great. Um, so we did roll call. Um, approval of the March 15th minutes. I, I move, move to accept the minutes. Second. Does anyone have discussion of the minutes? No. Okay. Uh, then a motion to approve the minutes. All in favor? Aye. Okay. That looks like everybody. Uh, so I won't ask if anybody's opposed. Um, okay. Going back to. <coughs> this would be easier if I had two monitors. Elections. So I'm assuming, what does that mean, Chris? So in our regular business rhythm, typically at our May meeting, we would have new commission members. Since we did not have any applicants, we do not have any new commissioners, but we still wanted to give the option to um, do elections if we there was a desire to change the chair and vice chair. Alternatively, there is going to be another advertisement for um, uh, vacancies on all of the city's boards and commissions. And so uh, we would hope that by the um, July or at the very latest um, October commission meetings, we would have new commissioners and we could hold elections then. But entirely up to you. We just wanted to put on the agenda. Uh, maybe since we don't have a lot of time, um, as long as Sue, you're happy to continue serving as a uh, uh, chair with uh, Ryan um, and Jennifer as vice chairs on respective um, commissions, then uh, we can move forward and, and either be happy with this slate or uh, postpone to a future date. Yeah, let's, I, I would suggest we wait until to see if we get more members, as you suggest in October. 
So okay. Unless, yeah, if there is if there is no um, objection, then we will reflect that in the minutes and plan for that. Uh, the October at the latest, or whenever we have the a new slate of uh, commissioners. Okay, great. Any objection? Seeing none. Okay, next item is public participation. Not sure if there's anyone from the public here. Jessica Hernandez, I don't know. Jessica. I believe that everyone that we have here is to support um, various agenda items, unless anybody speaks or raises their hand otherwise. Okay. Who's showing up in attendees? Okay. Christine. Oh, Christine. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Christine is one of our new uh, um, community vitality staff members. So, listening okay. and follow the discussion. Okay. Moving on, record speed, consent agenda. Um, so there's first the consent agenda, and then there's the uh, unless there are questions posed by commission. Um, okay, so we only have to okay the consent agenda, or we don't have to do anything. No, no formal vote required. Um, there are no action items in it other than making sure you're all up to speed on uh, various things going on in the department. If you have any questions, we're happy to entertain them. Otherwise, we can move on to the formal agenda items. Okay. Are there any questions on the consent agenda or the fund financials? Back. No. Right. Okay. And then matters from staff. Chris Aglin. I love it, Sue. Moving right along, you're going to be permanent chair uh, if you're not more <laughs> careful. <laughs> All right. Looking for Chris Aglin. There he is. I'll let you go. And and yes, Chris, I, I I would ask, I know that you know we have a presentation because we are short on time. Um, if we could move as quickly as possible, that would be very helpful. But um thank you, Chris, um, Jessica, and others who are here to talk about curbside management. Yes, thank you. And and we can certainly go through, uh, you know, we, we've uh, presented some information, provided an IP in the past to this commission. So things should be moving pretty smoothly. Jess, would you be able to put up the share and do the PowerPoint? I I literally just walked in the door from the NACTO conference. So. <laughs> but uh, thank you uh, for your time. Uh, we're here today to talk about curbside management. This is a project we've been working on for the last two years. Uh, we've gone to all the boards and commissions and we are scheduled to go to TAB uh, in June uh, and have TAB do a motion to advise the city manager to use our curbside implementation guidebook uh, to uh, guide the city's practices of designated curbside uses uh, in the city. Um, but we wanted to provide you with kind of a final update and then uh, after TAB we'll, we'll complete the implementation guidebook and be able to share that as well. So just as a reminder, curbside management is essentially looking at how the city uses the curb, which in physical terms is that, you know, piece of public right of way uh, adjacent to the sidewalk and the curb. Um, and what we want to do is manage the curb because there are a number of different uses uh, on the curb. And we know quite recently there's been changes into, uh, into the demand of the curb based on some changes in commerce. Next slide, please. So, you know, the curb is really important to manage because it is that front door. It's that transition zone between many different modes connecting to different transportation options. You know, other than, you know, the streets themselves, the curb may be the, the next largest uh, public resource. And as I said, uh, there are a number of different competing demands for that curb and new ones that have kind of emerged, you know, through the uh, through the COVID uh, pandemic and and how we reacted to that, but also just as how commerce has changed. You know, when you think about uh, transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, uh, increases in package delivery from Amazon, UPS, FedEx, all those things. Um, and we do want to manage the curb to help achieve some of the our community goals by making it uh, safe, efficient, uh, and to meet all those uh, demands. So, you know, we have a number of different city goals from Vision Zero to reducing travel delay and emissions, 
uh, making more uh, people-centered placemaking, uh, economic vitality, and, and being uh, responsible govern governors of, of city tax dollars. So, you know, in terms of just a couple of these, like Vision Zero, we've seen a lot of unsafe activities around the pickup and drop off of passengers from TNCs, stopping in the middle of the road, uh, blocking traffic, people getting off on both sides of a car and, you know, in a travel lane in traffic. So, uh, we're working on setting up designated areas in our more busy commercial areas where Uber and Lyft will have to pick up and drop off people, uh, not just wherever they want. Um, we want to provide uh, these uh, flexible loading zones um, that are meeting the demand of delivery so we don't have double parking and travel delay associated with that. I think one of the real benefits of this project that we've been working on with the help of Fear and Peers and, and, our, and their other subconsultants has been developing a set of standardized operating procedures that staff can follow if they have a request for a curbside change, looking at data, understanding the surrounding area. Uh, we know that not all curbside uh, demands can be met on a single block face. So we really have to have a systematic network approach for how we meet the, the various demands at the curb. Uh, we also have uh, new coming up the expansion of, of uh, our e-scooter program and looking at where do we effectively park these uh, scooters. Sometimes there may be room on the sidewalks like we currently have for B-cycle stations. Other times we may be looking at moving them down off the curb into the public right of way. So there's a lot of changes that are happening that we that we need to set up these procedures for how we evaluate situations and then have our pr principal traffic engineer make those decisions. Next slide, please. Um, you know, this is the curbside management is just one of the many cogs in the complex gears of, of city plans. You know, we've got the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, Transportation Master Plan, the AMPS or the Access Management and Parking Strategies plans. And curbside management is, is just one of those many different gears that we're working on. Like, um, you know, we're working on the neighborhood uh, parking permit program. Uh, we just implemented um performance-based pricing in a number of our districts. We're evaluating the Chautauqua program now, and curbside is just one of those. So we just kind of show you the full context of how that is. And then I'll pass it on to Jessica from Consor, which is one of our consultants working on this project. Okay, thanks, Chris. And um, everybody, I'm gonna go through quickly. So just feel free to raise a hand or stop me if I'm going too quickly or you have a specific question. So um, starting off this project, what we did is look at what the existing curb uses are right now, and then what's, what are some of them that might be proposed? And I think a lot of people know, you just saw that flex zone sign, flexible loading zone sign that Chris showed on that last slide. That's one of the proposed um, uses, also parklets and public outdoor seating, public outdoor dining, and car share parking is another thing that we've been looking at. Um, to really understand where these uses might be prioritized, we decided that it would be helpful to look at streets. And so understanding by street type, what uses would be most appropriate for those streets. So um, we looked at land use overlaid with the different street functional classifications. And so you can see along the top of this um, matrix right here, those are the street classifications, arterials, collectors, and then on the side are, are different land uses. And Using that data, we came up with four different types of streets. Um, you can see those on the right, commercial center, residential corridor, industrial corridor, and neighborhood avenue, and two types of alleys. This is a map of that kind of manifests those different street types, our street typology. And then using that for every street type, we also developed what we call a curb hierarchy. And this is where we talk about, we can actually say which, which curb uses are the most appropriate for these different streets and um, which ones should be prioritized. So you can see on the far left here, there's commercial center. And that's, those are, those are the downtown streets that are either in on the, on the, this, this line right here inside of the managed districts like Boulder Junction or um, outside of managed districts. And they're pretty similar with this access for people. So bike parking, bus stops, um, 
passenger pickup and drop off being um, what we would want to prioritize. But inside of a managed district, maybe a little bit more of that placemaking, so trees or parklets. Um, and then outside of, because there is a little bit more money because it's a bid or a GID. Um, and then outside, maybe having a little bit more um, commerce. So then we started to look at what, how could we start to shift towards this vision and towards this street typology curb hierarchy? And so, for example, in a commercial center right now, if these are existing uses, so this blue here is vehicle storage, private private vehicle parking, basically. And then the pink is that access for people, the kind of those, you know, bus stops, um, bike parking. Um, yellow is that commerce. and then And then the green is that activation. Remembering that we had prioritized the the um, access for people at the top, shifting more towards that. And even though even though access or or vehicle storage is the is the lowest priority, it still is going to make up the highest use on most of the streets. So we also took a look at alleys um, and, and really determined that alleys kind of can provide two uses. They can either be the place where those uses that you don't want front and center on your main streets, you can locate those in alleys, or they can be used for activation. So a place that it might be really nice to go and sit or eat or, or walk around. Um, I think a lot of people hopefully have seen them in Longmont and Fort Collins. There's some cities around here that have already really started to activate their alleys. You'll see murals on the side. They'll be really clean. Um, and so this is a vision that that um, that Boulder is starting to look towards. And um, we started to map out, you know, did a really high level look at where those where those activated alleys might be. Um, but we've also recommended that there be a future access alley access plan as well to look deeper into it. Another thing that we did through this project was to kind of to help the ramp process um, to look at where managed parking um, should or sh should be located if it's not already. So really looking at those paid areas to kind of define a process to um, either clean up some of the boundaries. Sometimes the paid parking um, boundary might be a little bit inconsistent or figure out where there is not paid parking, but that should be shifted towards paid parking. Um, so we developed a process for that that's really consistent with a lot of the other ramp processes. And we have um, identified and developed ordinance language to help with policies to support this guidance. So the first thing is, you know, just referencing using the guidebook in, in the different ordinances. That's the first bullet. Um, also talking about how um, the city manager can actually make determinations about when to change different curb uses. Um, the we also helped with the performance based parking pricing um, changing with the ordinance that says that instead of actually if if there's lower um, utilization of a street rather than lowering the price for that street actually being able to adjust the supply to make the demand higher and this and our and the curb use this guidebook really gives a lot of opportunities to use it to instruct on what what other types of curb uses could be prioritized instead of vehicle storage and the last is to give um, pretty clarify, uh, more clarification for developers and how to use this guidance and, and to understand when the city might come in if a developer is changing land uses, when the city might come in um, to look at relook at the land, the curbside uses in reaction to those new land uses and understanding that it might not always be parking right outside of your front door. We did do some pilot projects. Um, the flexible loading zone was one. I'm not sure how many of you actually um, saw the signs or, or parked in them, but um, it was a pretty successful pilot and we got a lot of information out of it. Um, the goal was to take all of these different types of short-term uses that are at the curb. So that could be um, Uber, Lyft, you know, drop-off pickup or you know, a personal vehicle dropping off their child or, or picking up somebody. Um, 
doing a, a quick curbside pickup, either, you know, food or, or something that you've bought, that became so much more a part of our, our society after, you know, during COVID and it stuck with us. Um, and so having these areas where they can be used by these multiple different uses, including commercial loading and drop off, and so that you didn't have loading zones sitting, um, just really having the curbside be used at its highest and best, most efficient use. Um, some of the findings were that we did see a reduction in collisions there, you know, the data is pretty short and limited, but even in that short amount of data, we did see some, some reduction. Um, we did see a really um, big range of vehicle types that were using it. You can see these pie charts on the right that show, um, you know, private vehicles, but look at the number of TNCs, the Uber and Lyfts that were using them, some delivery vehicles, and then how long these different types of vehicles were, were using them. Um, there was a really high productivity. It was, they were really well utilized. So um, the takeaway is that these are gonna become a, a new curbside use moving forward. There are some adjustments, like some better signage and some better communication and adjusting to 15 minutes instead of 10 minutes. I'm gonna ask a question here. Yeah. Because you use the same colors on these two pie charts, they do not correspond, correct? They do not correspond. Yeah, one, one is vehicle type and one is the length of time. But yeah, they're they're not, they don't correspond to like TNCs, non-TNCs being blue in the same one. Okay. Right, okay, thank you. So we also define, you know, when when are these changes going to be implemented, and and what would what would actually spark a change? And so um, there are these few, four categories, and I'm going to go through each of them that might that might um, spark a change in the different curbside uses. So the first one is um, when there is development, and I mentioned that earlier that if there is some change in development, then um, the city would look at what the existing curbside uses are and see if there if an adjustment needs to be made. Um, the second is capital projects, and this is one where you can really see efficiencies in that, you know, if you're looking at the curbside uses at the same time as the capital project is being developed or, or going on, um, you, there's a big cost savings there. Proactive changes is something that the city is going to be look at, looking at, and the different levers that might start a proactive change are areas where there's a lot of crashes, where um, you're hearing a lot of complaints from the community, um, citations, a lot of a lot of reasons for enforcing people are not already following the rules that are there, um, and low or high utilization, in particular that low utilization piece where, you know, maybe the um, with the performance based pricing it's an area where there is lower demand and we might want to try to support um, increasing the demand. Um, this is what we call reactive changes, but this is what Chris was talking about earlier with one of the one of the results of this project that um, I think is going to be used a lot by staff. And this is really um, for every curbside use. If there's a request from the public, and so that could come from a business, it could come from a resident for a change in curb use or a new curb use. Um, there's now a very um, um, laid out process that is data driven for staff to go through. And so um, we have these sheets where it's um, kind of a flow chart and you have a score for um, how to make a decision on whether a curb use should be changed from the from the request from the public. Um, and we recently did one. And so um, I'm going to go through that really quickly just to kind of show you how it works. Um, we got a request in the downtown from a restaurant that um, was hoping to have um, three flexible loading zones um, placed outside of their restaurant in a place where there was currently none. Um, and so we went through the process. And so the first question is, is there another good loading zone or flexible loading zone in the block, including the alleys? And there was one, but it was across the street. So in that case, you can see the points over here, and it might be small, so I'll just tell you, with a yes, it's a one, it's one point, and with a no, it's two points. Um, are there any other uses in addition to the business that's requesting the flexible loading zone that would utilize a flex loading zone? So other, other restaurants, other, um, other retail um, businesses that might be selling clothes that you would go and pick up um, a really quick package. And so 
it got a score of three. Yes, there are more than three businesses. Is there a crash history, high ticketing of loading vehicles, anecdotal evidence of non-compliant loading activity, passenger pickup drop-off, unintended vehicles? And um, we have seen a lot of double parking and a lot of um, passenger pickup and drop off. And so this one got um, five points for a yes. And then um, is the flexible loading zone located on a corridor that's current or proposed for a bicycle facility? And that's a no. And that gets five points. And the reason is that these flex loading zones where you have really high turnover, you don't want to have a lot of those conflicts with a bike lane, for example. And so you can see the score was the highest of all of the different categories. And what we did is we came up with a range for all of these scores. So if it scores in this highest range, then it's just yes, it should be implemented. If it's in the mid range, then it's most likely, but staff would really need to think about it and make a determination based on the context. And if it scores really low, then it's not appropriate. So once this decision has been made, then we've also developed curb guidance that shows for, um, for in this case, it's a commercial center, one of those commercial corridors. And, and um, it sh we have developed guidance that shows, you know, only half of the block, 40 to 60% should be vehicle parking, but you should really be focusing on these um, access for people or access for commercial, um, I'm sorry, access for commerce uses. And then it shows how it should be distributed. So in this case, for example, these this color right here, this brownish color is flex zones, which is what we've been talking about. And um, our recommendation is to try to put two flex zones or two parking spaces that are both designated flexible loading zones together where possible because that can accommodate a longer vehicle, a longer commercial loading vehicle. And then for implementation, we've also developed what we're calling cut sheets. So they're kind of these one page guidance, design guidance that um, tells you more about how it should be implemented. So in this case, if you're implementing a flex zone, what are the, this on the bottom right is what, what departments need to help and what are their roles and responsibilities, some, some guidance and, and um, considerations for how you would design it. As part of this project, we've also been working on um, helping to make some communication materials. And so um, this is this is in draft and in progress. But one of the things that we have been asked, even through the pilot, is you know, that loading zone, that flexible loading zone seemed to be empty more than a vehicle parking space. But what we know is that even if it's empty, even for just a quarter or even a half of the time, it's actually turned over a lot more people or gave given a lot more people and uses access to the curb because cars are only staying there or commercial vehicles for a shorter period of time. And so um, we, we're trying to make some guidance and some handouts for staff to be able to use to explain this. So comparing in a course of an hour, let's say a flexible loading zone as compared to um, a private parking space, it can support four times as many people or goods to two and a half times as much goods loading. And so um, that's one handout that we're making. And then another one is talking about what is a flexible loading zone and how should you use it? What are the benefits of it? You know, the same, you know, that in the short time it promotes high turnover, that it can be used very productively as different uses or different demands shift throughout the day or the week. And then, um, you know, how you would use it and then, you know, what you might do. Residents and visitors might grab a cup of coffee, ride share drivers might um, drop, off, drop off passengers or wait. And I should say that one, one of the things that we noticed is that there were a lot of um, vehicles that did use the parking spaces and didn't get out of their cars. And so our understanding from doing some of our intercept, video, intercept um, surveys later is that it was TNCs that were using it instead of driving around waiting for their next ride, it gave them a spot to sit and dwell, which really increases safety, it's environmental benefits. And then also if people wanted to, you know, look for their destination instead of looking at their cell phone as they're driving around, they had a quick place to be able to pull over. Jessica. Um... Will there be any idling guidelines in these in these spots as in turn off your vehicle? I'm gonna uh, let Chris answer that. Yeah, I I you know that that is actually something that um we have not uh looked at specifically, but it, it's a great uh question. And I'm I will definitely ask. I 
I don't think currently the city has anti idling guidelines anywhere. I may be wrong, but I don't I don't know about that. But let me do some research. Uh, so regardless would of be whether or not beneficial. It's a, yeah, regardless of whether or not it's a citywide thing, maybe it's something that could be applied to the specific type, right? So yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that that is a great point. Um, so about implementation, it's not going to be something that happens all at once. Um, you know, it's going to be with those proactive where there are a lot of crashes, where there have been a lot of citizen complaints, um, that would be proactive really based on when funding's available and then prioritizing, you know, those commercial, those commercial centers, the commercial corridors. So that's in, in the, you know, the downtown Uni Hill, but then, you know, some of the areas that are outside of um, those commercial districts as well, like the steel yards or um, Alpine balsam. And then um, the other types of uses that would be prioritized to be um, looked at and implemented through these are the flex loading zones, passenger loading zones, um, really just trying to, to make sure that those are efficiently placed. Um, reactive as, as getting these requests, like um, Chris's team just got recently from that restaurant. Um, and then again, as data evaluation moves on and um, everything will be communicated to the public and getting continued feedback. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take over from here. So yeah, this is definitely gonna be an iterative process. You know, there may be some, some changes that happen, you know, in a phased approach certainly we have a number of loading zones that are currently time restricted. They're a loading zone from 7 to 10 a.m., for example. Well, we know from our pilot projects, you make those a 24-7 loading zone, and they are going to be used, and they're going to be used throughout the day by multiple different uses, you know, whether it's food and, and beverage delivery in the morning, FedEx, UPS, Amazon deliveries all day long, and then Uber and Lyft all night long. You know, we've just seen the that these uh, loading zones are used and they're needed, and they prevent a lot of traffic delay, double parking, and increased safety. So there may be some quick changes related to that, but I think some of the other changes are going to you know come at a slow rate based on request, based on opportunity. Uh, I will uh, ensure, as I've told the Downtown Management Commission and uh, the Uni Hill Commission, that you know if if we're making changes in Boulder Junction. We're going to come to this board and, and get feedback. Uh, we do have a request right now um, with the 30 and 30 Pearl project about creating a flexible loading zone uh, near one of their facilities where they have a number of people that have uh, disabilities and require uh, a lot more uh, access to like uh, paratransit and via. And so looking at creating a spot there where via vehicles, you know, can come and, and pick up and drop off people is just an, one example. So we're we're already seeing it. It's been great to be able to test, you know, some of these uh, plans that that we've put in place, you know, uh, and 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 see what uh, the the answers are with our tools that we've come up. Um, but we've we've gone to the commissions. This is our last stop on the commissions. Uh, we have an Access Allies uh, meeting. Uh, actually, I think it's Friday, uh, and Access Allies is our community working group that has met uh, with the staff team throughout this time, so we're going to go to them. And then in June, uh, we're going to ask TAB to look at the curbside management implementation guidebook, uh, see if there requires any changes or, or updates or edits to that, and then we're essentially going to ask TAB to uh, make a motion to advise the city manager to use the guidebook in the future uh, when looking at curbside uses in the city. Um, we'll inform council of that decision uh, from TAB uh, in an information packet following that meeting. Uh, maybe not as soon as June 15th, we may need to you know, make a few adjustments in the guide based on their feedback, but uh, we plan on alerting city council of that. And then city council's opportunity to really weigh in on this is when we bring to them any changes in ordinance language or city manager rules. But um, under the Boulder Revised Code, the authority is given to the city manager to uh, make changes to curbside uses. So uh, those are kind of the next steps. We hope that once we get those ordinance changes, 
uh, we'll begin using that implementation guidebook uh, definitely in 2024, if not um, before that time, to help us start making uh, some of these changes to make our curbside work more effectively. And I think that it concludes our presentation. So thank you for your time. Happy to take any questions. How do you um, reconcile the fact that in those managed districts that access for people is the highest priority, but still most of the space is going to storage of cars? Yeah, well, I, I think we we understand that uh, people drive, people come down park, um, businesses depend on people coming, and still most people arrive in cars. You know, we may have goals to reduce that number and and mode shift and change travel behavior, but um, the fact is that that people still uh, arrive in vehicles. Um, but at the same time, we have we have a vision that of making slow, you know, incremental changes to the curbside and curbside uses. So, you know, when I think about the performance-based pricing, uh, and we look at areas of very high parking demand, we are looking at increasing pricing uh, to help manage that demand. There may be a couple blocks away uh, block faces that have underutilized parking. Well, there may be an opportunity then either to change some of the uses on the highly utilized, knowing that, that people will now park in other areas, or change some uses on those underutilized areas to meet other demands, such as you know, access for people or placemaking. Um, you know, it, I think what will be really interesting is you know, the, uh, the city's looking at a downtown public spaces project. There's also going to be a future downtown mobility study. Uh, and I think that will really help uh, shed light on, you know, how are we going to be transforming that the city? You know, we've the decision was made to open up West Pearl to vehicle traffic again. And but what other opportunities and other places do we have to continue making, you know, place making, having parklets, having outdoor dining, those types of things. So hopefully um, that answers your question. Um, since you brought up West Pearl, right, th there's still very narrow uh, sidewalks there. So has any consideration been given to, you know, as part of curb management, uh, you yeah. know, moving the curb? Yeah. Um, not not uh, any discussions that we've had. Uh, essentially, you know, that is, uh, un, you know, part of a different work program, uh, not my work program. And I think the decisions are being made way above <laughs> my, <laughs> my station. Uh, so we, we haven't looked specifically at that, but certainly, you know, those are things that I think they're going to look at as part of that downtown public spaces project and the, and the downtown mobility study, because yeah, I mean, that that's part of the thing when I think about uh, the scooters expansion. You know, council said yes, let's expand scooters. Well, there are places like West Pearl with narrow sidewalks where there's no room to put a scooter corral. And if you want to manage scooter parking and not have the clutter, which is usually one of the number one complaints, well, we've got to figure out where else can we put that, and that could be below the curb. Uh, and creating those those types of corrals uh, because there is already so much pedestrian activity and a lot of infrastructure on the sidewalk. So, uh, but I think Westboro will be tackled, uh, you know, in in a different work effort other than this. I, I hope that our curbside uh, policies and practices that we've created helps inform that, but uh, that it certainly is a a different process. All right, thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? Thanks, Chris and Jessica for a presentation. Yeah, thank you. No. Nope. And uh, next is oops, the wrong part of the agenda. Um KMA branding wayfinding Regan. Thanks, Sue. So my updates will be super brief. Um, and actually the KMA wayfinding and branding update should be renamed to just Boulder Junction. 
wayfinding and branding project. KMA was our design firm that we worked with previously and that contract is closed out. Um, so just to reiterate, this project is related to the wayfinding and branding signage um, that we're rolling out in Boulder Junction this year in an effort to reinforce and raise awareness of Boulder Junction as a district, um, as well as the various access, access options available within the district. Um, and this will include a mix of gateway, pedestrian, directional, and destination-based signage. So we have selected a vendor out of Loveland, Colorado called E3 Signs to fabricate and install the wayfinding signage. Um, they've worked with several municipalities and have a lot of experience with this type of work. So we're confident um, in working with them and looking forward to that. We have an almost finalized agreement and a kickoff meeting with them actually this Friday. Um, among other city stakeholders to discuss the timeline and some immediate next steps, including obtaining permitting and approvals to install the signage. And if all goes according to plan with permitting and approval processes, we should see wayfinding signage beginning to be installed hopefully by late summer. And if anyone would like a refresh on those designs or can't remember what the design documents look like, I'm happy to send those your way or have Lisa send them. Any questions? Great, thank you so much. Um, next up is BTVC activation series. It says Lane, but I'm guessing it's actually Karen. So I was actually going to provide, yeah, I can provide yeah. a brief update and then Karen, feel free to chime in. But this is related to the funding that Community Vitality provided Boulder Transportation Connections at the beginning of this year to organize and hold a series of activation events in Boulder Junction, um, really to just promote and celebrate the district, raise awareness of the various access, access options and the benefits um, to employees and residents of the district and really aim to get more visitors and put traffic into the area. So to recap, there will be a series of five events. Two have already occurred. So there will be three more. The next one will be a bike home happy hour aligning with summer bike to work day, which will take place on June 28th from 4 to 7 p.m. at Zeal Restaurant. I will have um, Lisa send the flyer for that. And then secondly, mark your calendars for September 14th, which will be the date of the largest event out of the series. Um, we're still nailing down a name for the event, but essentially it'll be a really large community-wide celebration of Boulder Junction and everything it has to offer. It'll be held in Depot Square. It'll have food trucks, live music, likely a beer and wine garden activities. So it'll be a really fun celebration, September 14th. You know what time? It'll likely be in the evening, I imagine, 4 to 7 p.m., but more details to come, and we'll definitely send you all a flyer once that's finalized. Okay, seeing no questions on that. I have, I have a question. Oops, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, what was the attendance at that last event? Because I do know that Boom did not send out any notices until multiple reminders the day of the last events of the clean air month event so i believe there were about 50 to 60 attendees unfortunately the weather was not ideal it started downpouring right around the time of the event um so i think 50 to 60 karen i know you're online so correct me if i'm wrong to 60 can was you, approximate can you if you can hear me 50 okay. to 60 was the approximate count that we had yeah yeah okay and, and we did um we did send emails a week or two in advance to all the property managers and the hr contacts that we had at the um at the various employers beforehand and then also right before the event as well yeah so maybe you want to just send a note either to me or to the board um you know a, several days before if you if you sent something to Boom Properties and I can let you know whether or not residents have gotten it. Okay, that sounds great, thanks. 
And if, and if anybody else has any feedback for us too, as we um, plan for the next events, that's great as well. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Okay, thank you guys. Next up is Chris Jones of 2024 budget preview. Yes, and I'm, thank you so much, Sue. I am presenting for Teresa, who is on a much deserved vacation. Um, and I'm gonna to try to fly through this just because I wanna make sure we get enough time to keep question at the end. But we are um, beginning our 2024 um, budget cycle. Um, so typically the, the process is we, the department comes up with a proposed budget um, that includes new requests and um, um, proposals for the six year capital improvement plan. We do this for all the districts that we serve as well as um, our use of the general funds. Um, this is our regular business cycle. Um, you can see uh, you know, at the top right, um, we meet with commissions um, annually to discuss um, your priorities and also uh, discuss them in the context of the council uh, priorities that we obtain through their retreat process, but then goes into the development of our annual work plans in the department. Um, and then uh, further financial projections and strategic planning. That leads to the budget development process that we're in right now um, um, that the department pulls together that feeds into the citywide uh, budget that council then reviews and adopts. It's, a, it's our regular process, but the timeline has been adjusted um, in the past couple of years using our new OpenGov platform. So right now we're in our process of developing our internal uh, budget that will then work to share um, uh, across the organization. We are not yet at a place where we can share it with the commission to get approved prior to the council approval. So um, what I do wanna communicate is we are using the priorities that we've uh, discussed with the commission um, through your retreat process and in our regular conversations with you all to guide our ongoing budget asks specifically for the Boulder Junction districts. So I'm not gonna read through these priorities, but I um, want you to know that, that as you've been seeing with the work that we've been delivering from the KMA uh, wayfinding and branding, that was, a, I, that was a priority that you all identified a number of years ago. We identified budgets to make sure that we could follow through that uh, on that commitment. The Boulder Junction Phase Two, which was you know the priority, had been TVAP um, Phase Two. Uh, the Planning Department is moving forward with that. Of course, unfortunately, uh, they did not check with us before they scheduled their session, uh, their open house this afternoon. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's why we're going to get done really early, so you all can get over and participate with their event at the Junkyard Social. Um, but again, we continue to want to enhance transit options in the district, uh, partnering with RTD whenever possible. But um, uh, as of late, we've partnered a lot with the Boulder Transportation Connections to communicate all the great options that are available in the Boulder Junction area and get more people to sign up for them. Um, and so that relates to our other priorities around neighborhood and community collaborations. We would love to see more participation from folks like the Steel Yards, but also conversations about where do we go next with these districts. There's been a lot of conversations in the commissions about um, maybe uh, reducing the mill levy to better match the services that are being provided currently. Um, to, uh, through the Boulder Junction Phase 2 conversation, maybe there will be a change in the overall um, uh, format and design of this special district or the general improvement district in the Boulder Junction area that will translate to some uh, different mill levy obligations that could reduce that property tax burden. Regardless, um, through these conversations we're having with planning, uh, we're gonna continue to, to push for our long-term capital plan, understanding what the obligations will be of the funds that have building, been building up associated with the districts versus um, um, other capital campaigns that might be uh, developed to support infrastructure um, expansions in the, the BJET area east of the railroad tracks. Um, but uh, as I said, these are the current uh, priorities that we're looking to to help form our budgets to um, 
come with a proposal to you all um, at our next meeting, which is the big question for you all because of our budget cycle um, and the cadence of these meetings, we are not scheduled to have a regularly scheduled meeting with Boulder Junction commissions until um, July, which is too late for our uh, budget process um, before we have put the citywide budget together and gone to council. So we are proposing that uh, there is a joint or sort of combined commission budget meeting, not just with you all, but also with the Downtown Management Commission and the University Hill Commercial Area Management Commission in June, um, proposed for, oh, do we have a date yet? We don't have a date yet. Uh, the joint budget meeting? Either the 13th or the 14th, somewhere around the 12th, 13th, 14th. Okay. I want to send a poll out. So, um, if the commission supports this, we would like for you all to join in a joint commission meeting. We've already met with the other commissions there on board. Um, so we're wanting direction from you all. If we get a thumbs up, we will include you in that joint commission meeting so we can all approve the various budgets together at the same time. Ryan? Would you need a quorum i don't if it's that week i don't know if i could attend so i, I don't know if you'd need a quorum there or if that would just be informational we would need a quorum for a formal um motion to approve the preliminary budget yeah i can't i'm away till the 14th too so so we'll we're targeting so yeah we'll, we're, it's good feedback that that week might not be good we'll do a doodle poll to understand what the capabilities are of uh, the other commissions um, because we have not narrowed in on a specific date yet that's where we're targeting so this is good feedback and helpful um, is there anybody who's not who would much rather have a standalone meeting and does not want to meet with a joint commission all right then we'll continue to work to, to find a date that can work for a quorum. Um, um, otherwise, we might end up having to go through another, maybe a very short um, uh, budget uh, meeting with you all at a time that, that works for these commissions. Okay. Um, but just real quick, this is the timeline. Um, um, here, we are reviewing the, the um, priorities in our budget process. Um, in June, we'll bring the, the formal um, draft budget to you all. Um, and then at the end of June, we submit those approved commission budgets and the department budget to the, the budget office. But then we'll turn it into uh, an internal review before we go to council in September. Um, and then council will presumably adopt um, in October. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Any questions on our budget process? <clears throat> All right. Well, Ryan, last... do you want to put your hand down? Yeah, you, you, your hand's still. Thanks. Um, last but not least, Lisa, do you want to share some updates on our uh, uh, second round of commissioner recruitment? Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Um, Mid year commissioner recruitment. So the city clerk's office will be accepting another round of commission applications starting May 29th through July 2nd. Um, interviews with the candidates will be conducted on July 11th and 12th, and then at the city council meeting on August 3rd, new commissioners will be appointed. So um, nothing's been posted on the city's website yet. Uh, the past practice has been and continue to be that candidates will um, apply through the website. So we are hopeful that we will get uh, plenty of interest in TDM and parking, and um, we'll keep you updated. We will also plan to, again, reach out to the property managers in the area and let them know. And with our, our partners at the Boulder Transportation Connections, folks have been building these connections with uh, residents. Um, property owners in the area will want to make sure they are aware of this opportunity uh, to join uh, these commissions. So um, that concludes matters from staff. 
Okay, so then we have economic status of the BJ parking district and the future. I don't know what that is. I, oh, Ryan, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think if Kevin had wanted to discuss that, maybe we just postpone until he's present. Okay. And then the second one where it's BJAD phase two multi-board working group. I have not gotten an invite to that yet. Have you, Ryan? I only heard confirmation that they would put me on the list when it went out. That's all I got. Yeah, because I know like Kevin Kraus is on the public one and he went, he's been to one, but I haven't heard anything about that. Is there any way, Chris, you can check with this? Yes, I, we have some strongly worded uh, uh, conversations to have regarding their double booking of this afternoon um, <laughs> and uh, getting some updates on that process. But okay. fortunately yeah, we have an hour left. Yeah. I know okay. the group that Kevin Krauss signed up for, which is maybe like general public or something, they have met at least once. So I'm not sure our, why our group has not. I will follow up anything. with the planning team and hopefully it is imminent. Okay. Okay. Does any, that looks like it. Does anybody have anything else? We're going to finish in an hour. We have two minutes. <laughs> Rebecca. Uh, just a quick ask. Um, you know, there's a lot of these meetings where we have presentations given to us live during the meeting. And I was wondering if we could get more of those included in the packet that we get beforehand. Certainly, at the at the very least, we can make sure you have them um, for reference after, preferably, um, uh, possibly memo form at the very least. The thing with the PowerPoints is sometimes they're they're not prepared um, as far in advance as the packets are. So thanks for the request, and we will certainly get you as much information um, ahead. And I, I did think that there was supposed to be a packet for the curbside management. And it seems that that was not in your packet. No, it was not. So that would be, I'm not sure what where that landed. Um, so there should have been a packet because I think that was probably your media presentation, a lot of information. Um, so I certain, I apologize that there was not a memo associated with that. Maybe they were relying on their previous um, packet because there was, I think at your last meeting, there was a meaty folder or curbside management um, memo. I don't know why there was not one this time. Yeah, but there was a lot of new stuff in that. Yeah. That she presented. Agreed. Agreed. And then one follow-up from that related to, to the packets and timing and whenever we can get them, um, you know, before, soon after. Um, can we send out the minutes earlier, like sooner after meetings? Because then when we start looking at it two months from now, then it's like, yeah, I think that was right, but it's definitely fresher. Sure. Um, Lisa and I can discuss, I mean, we do have a number of commissions that they all meet within the same span of time, but I, I think we could get them to you certainly before your packet um goes out for your following meeting so okay. not immediately after the meetings but maybe within a number of weeks after the meetings um we can get you a draft um it might be different from what you know depending on what happens after review it might be different from what you see in your final packet if we catch something between the draft that we send you and the actual formal packet but i think we could probably get you something certainly earlier than your next packet. All right, thank you. Ryan. Yeah, uh, sorry, I almost forgot. Um, Chris and I got a direct email about someone having trouble with the um, kiosk at the parking garage in Boulder Junction. I just wanted to know, do does the city hear from other people that that's a challenging experience to use? I'm just kind of curious um you know if if this is particular to maybe the one person or if this was something that is more of an ongoing challenge i i know that i'm not sure if it's going to be the same gateless technology that's going to be installed in the other districts so just wanted to know if that was something we hear about frequently 
Thanks for the question. It's frequently certainly not the word I would use. I would say for first time users, the garage can be very confusing is the way that you, you, you typically pay at those pay stations is you pay for your time before you have to get how much longer you're going to be in the garage. And this is a pay after. Um, so we do hear occasionally, um, but also acknowledge that, that we've contracted out all of the owners of the garage. There are five owners and they've contracted out to these folks. Um, this is part of the charge of the, Owners Association to clean up the wayfinding and the, the informational signage in the garage to be more user friendly. Certainly was not surprising to get the complaint, but um, I'd say that, that we have a ton of folks who are using the garage and they are paying for their parking. Um, and this particular instance, if you, you physically don't pay, you are going to get a ticket. Um, and uh, Hard to understand for sure what their experience was and why they weren't able to, to manage payment through the kiosk. Um, but I certainly agree that it's not the most user friendly experience, especially your first time. Jennifer, you had your hand up or was that a mistake? <clears throat> no, I'll go ahead and 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 share because that happened to me too. As a commissioner, I figured I would understand the parking and yeah, I, it just, I didn't get where to pay or what to do. So I'm glad to hear that they are looking at how to better communicate or manage that. I did end up getting a parking ticket that was, you know, a complete drag and I just didn't get what to do. Like I always pay for parking, but the pay as you leave, I think anyhow, it just, it didn't make sense. So I do think that's an important thing to improve. I appreciate that it was a first time use issue. Um, and I think I always think we we want more first time users. We want more people who are not familiar. So I don't know if the um, the new system or if we can encourage the I guess it's some kind of HOA that's managing this if we can provide them some feedback. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we have uh, forwarded the correspondence on to them for uh, their appreciation and understanding that this needs, this does need, need improvement. We are not um, duplicating the Boulder Junction system in the downtown garages, but we did include an ad alternative in our contract that the owners association could choose to, to work with them to maybe overhaul, redo the, the depot square garage. Um, to this new system. Great, thank you, Chris. Anything else? There was a hand up online. Let's see. From Lynn Siegel. Oh, she, she, she had, had an echo. Oh. Um, okay, uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Maybe uh, I guess see you in June for the budget. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Thank for you. thanks for running a great meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Nice you. and fast. <laughs> bye bye. See bye. ya.